Greetings, my friend, and welcome to the podcast, Teaching the Transforms with Dr. Jimmy Knott. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm continuing season of episodes on this all-important subject, one that I've been a student of and hopefully a practitioner of, and still a learner, and that's the subject of leadership. I'm calling this series, It's All About Leadership, Be a Leader Worth Following. By the way, that's the same title as my book that's available on Amazon. I hope you get it. I think you'll find it to be a very helpful resource. It's also available on my website, jimmynott.com. That's J-I-M-M-Y-K-N-O-T-T dot com. I think you'll find it, again, like I said, to be very helpful, very helpful too. How can you be the leader that you've always wanted? How can you be the leader that you wish you'd always had? What does it take to be a leader worth following. Well, what does that look like? Well, there are some non-negotiables in terms of qualities or key components or essentials. And they're based on Psalms 78, 72. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. What was it about David that Asaph observed that made David a leader? He had integrity. He had integrity of heart. He had authentic character. He had skillful hands. He had exceptional competence. And he was a shepherd. He connected with his sheep. Those three are the non-negotiables when it comes to the what of being a leader worth following. Authentic character, exceptional competence, and relational connection. Basically taking care of the people. It's less about you being in charge and more about you taking care of those in your charge. But how do you do that? How do you live that out? What's the how of a leader worth following? Well, I think the answer to that is be a servant leader. A leader worth following is a servant leader. The best reason to lead is to serve others. Always to serve others. Today our subject is about your toughest leadership challenge. And I think today is the key. Without living Without living this, there is no way to flesh out the what of being a leader worth following and the how. You've got to get this. This is the key that helps you live out the others. For many, many years as a developer of leaders, I've asked over and over and over again, who or what is your toughest leadership challenge? And I've received so many answers over the years, and very few have got it right. I've heard, well, my spouse... Uh, my kids, there's a situation going on at work or in life. And all of those can be very difficult, tough leadership challenges. But frankly, I think the toughest leadership challenge is leading yourself. Can you imagine with me a compass? We all know what a compass is. It shows directions. There's a north. There's a vertical direction, north and south. There's a west and east, a horizontal. If you could imagine a compass representing the various directions in which we lead as leaders. North would be leading up, where we lead up those who are in authority over us, our boss and the person that we report to, and that's important. Then there are those that that we lead across. Those would be co-workers or peers or friends or uh, the, a team or uh, or the colleagues that we work with. And then third, there would be down, down. And that's where you and I lead those that we are responsible for. But again, those aren't our toughest leadership challenges. All of us have flown and all of us have heard over and over and over again. In fact, we probably don't pay any attention to it when the flight attendant makes the announcement. In the case of losing cabin pressure, oxygen mass will drop down. If you're traveling with uh, with a small child, be sure to put your mask on first before you put theirs on. Why? Because if you lose consciousness because of a loss of oxygen, you're not going to be able to help your child. So take care of yourself first so you'll be able to take care of him or her second. Your toughest leadership challenge as a leader is always leading yourself. The most important person and in fact the hardest person to lead is you. If you can't lead you, Why should others let you lead them? Leadership starts with you, starts with me. It's not about title, it's not about position, not even about rank or authority. Before you lead anyone else, you must first lead yourself. 
Successful leadership is always preceded by self-leadership. In fact, your ability to lead you is your entrance exam to leading others. Why should I let you lead me if you won't follow you? Leading others well. Leading others well starts with leading yourself well. But I'm going to tell you, this is way, way harder than you think. Philosopher Aristotle made this statement. The hardest victory is over self. How true. Daniel Goleman, author of the bestseller Emotional Intelligence in 1995, concluded after extended research that, and I quote, the single greatest distinguishing factor between good leaders and great leaders is something to do with self-leadership. D. Hawk, who is the founder and was the former CEO of Visa, he's done significant research over the years regarding leadership. And he estimates how great leaders should invest their time and their energies. If I were to ask you, when you look back at that compass and we lead down, we lead across, and we lead up, what kind of percentage of your time and energy would you give each of those? My guess would be most of us would have the largest percentage leading down. Maybe leading across and leading up, probably very similar. But according to Hawk and his extensive research, he says we need to spend about 5% leading down. That's right, 5%. About 20% leading laterally across to our colleagues. About 25% leading up to the one or ones we report to. And then about 50%, let me repeat that, about 50% leading ourselves. Leading ourselves. Self-leadership is critical. Let me give you a uh, kind of a working definition of when I say self-leadership, what I'm talking about. It may be a little wordy, but hopefully I can unpack it. Self-leadership is the awareness, so important, awareness, the awareness of and the ability, the ability to manage your own strengths and weaknesses and motivations and emotions and decisions and limitations and so on, and to accurately understand how others perceive who you are, what you say, and what you do. So there is a self-management component here, but at the same time, there is an others' perception component as well. So important. I know one leader that I heard say one time, take whatever steps you need to take to become proficient at the single most important aspect of leadership, self-leadership. Thomas Watson who was a CEO at IBM for a number of years, said this, Nothing so conclusively proves a man's ability to lead others as what he does from day to day to lead himself. So how? How do we do a good job of leading ourselves well? Well, here's what I believe. Self-leadership emerges from self-awareness. We've discussed that earlier in the lesson on exceptional competency, and we return to it. Self-awareness can lead to greater self-discipline and greater personal responsibility and greater self-accountability, which in the end results in increased success. Without great self and other awareness, we can easily get off track and derail and then lose the ability to influence Self-aware people are honest with themselves about themselves and honest with others about themselves. There's no hiding. There's no hypocrisy. There's no lying to self or te deceiving yourself. So self-awareness is what brings about good self-leadership. Self-awareness enables us to know where and how to better lead ourselves, where and how to better lead ourselves. So let me spend a few minutes on where do we need to be self-aware so we can better lead ourselves. There's a real sense in the where. They, these are some of the key components that we've already talked about, but now we're talking about the critical importance of managing yourself well in these areas. Where should I provide better leadership to myself? Well, first, in guarding my character. 
You may recall, character is the setting that secures the gem. Guarding your character. Who am I? What makes me tick? What are my core values? Am I fleshing out those core values moment by moment, day by day? Choice of attitude, choice of behaviors. Guarding that character. That's the fundamental foundation of trust. Knowing that I will do what I say and I will fulfill my promises. If I'm going to lead myself well, I've got to guard my character. Next, I have to improve my competencies. Again, we talked about this in our study on exceptional competency. You've got to know what you do best to leverage it. So have you identified what you do best and enjoy most? Find your lane. Find your voice. Discover those few things. No, not many. Few things that you do best and improve them. And avoid all you can the things that you're not good at. Know your weaknesses, yes, but lead from your strengths. Third, practice discipline. Discipline in the right places, but especially in serving others. Work hard. Do what others are unwilling are unwilling to do often. Fourth, make meaningful connections. Build good chemistry with the people that you work around. We can never, ever be our best selves by ourselves. We need to constantly, constantly discipline ourselves and lead ourselves to show empathy, to be selfless, and to listen well, and to listen well. So those are key areas where we must do a better job of leading ourselves well in our character, our competencies, discipline, connections, and there's one more, and keeping our motivations pure. There are a lot of reasons to lead, but the best reason is to serve others. Always put others first, serving them, taking care of those people in your charge. It's never about you and never about me as a primary leader. So that's the where of self-awareness. Now how about the how? How can I better lead myself? Well, first, I think you have to know yourself to lead yourself. Especially, you need to know your negative, uh, uh, your negative tendencies because it's those tendencies that lead to actions and those actions lead to consequences and those consequences lead to a current reality. So currently, if there life experience going on in, in, in key relationships as a, as a husband or as a, a spouse or as a, a parent or as a co-worker or as a friend or finances, if things are you're not experiencing in your current reality something that's good, <clears throat> then backtrack and realize that that current reality is, is a consequence. And those consequences were set in motion by actions. And those actions were determined by your tendencies. And those tendencies, we all have them. Some of them we're born with. We get them by nature. Some of them is a result of nurture, our upbringing, and a culture in which we were raised. But all of them were a result of choice. Choices that we make. And those choices, again, lead to actions. And we need to know what our negative tendencies are. Maybe sometimes these are even blind spots. I know years ago... <clears throat> Excuse me. I had some friends. I gave them 30 days to talk to anyone in my life they wanted to talk to. Family, co-workers, friends. And I sent them on a journey to help me to discover what are my blind spots. And they had 30 days. In 30 days we got together. Now I need to tell you that over those 30 days I had taken the time to really consider what I thought were my blind spots. And I made a list of what I thought they were. When we gathered together that day and I asked them what had they discovered, this is what they said. Jimmy, your blind spots are that you tend to be too defensive, you tend to be too controlling, and frankly, as a result of those, you're too intimidating. Now, I got to tell you, when those men shared those blind spots with me, the first thing I did was look down on that sheet that I had prepared beforehand. And I realized. Not one of those three blind spots had I written down. I guess that's the reason they call them blind spots, negative tendencies. Granted, sometimes we are aware of them, but sometimes we're totally blind. So what are your negative tendencies? Perhaps blind spots. Do you talk too much? 
Do you talk too much about yourself? Are you a poor listener? Maybe quick-tempered, impulsive, moody, overly sensitive, unteachable, stubborn, inflexible, mistrusting, too quick to tell, too quick to talk? I mean, are those things that are part of your experience? I know a long time ago I did. I sat down with my spouse of many years and I said, Honey, nobody knows me better than you. So I want you to talk to me for a few minutes about what are what are the positive tendencies in my life and then what are some not so good tendencies in my life. And I said, start with the positive, honey. And she said, you know, Jimmy, you're organized, you're decisive, you're witty, you're funny, you, you, you get things done, you're, you're, you can be so thoughtful, uh, you lead well, you're dependable, uh, you, you challenge and you inspire people. That was so encouraging to me to have the one who knows me best to share that. And I said, okay, honey. Talk to me about the other side, the negative, the not-so-good tendencies. Well, you're impatient. And she added, you're defensive and controlling. You talk too much about yourself. You don't listen well sometimes. Well, those are things, I'll be honest with you, the moment that I became aware of those tendencies that were negative and those blind spots that those gentlemen shared with me, honestly, I got better immediately. Now, does that mean that those have disappeared and they're no longer negative tendencies? Of course not. But being self-aware has enabled me to have greater self-leadership over all those negative tendencies, which ultimately impact my ability to influence and to lead others. That's such a helpful tool to better lead myself well. There's a second tool. It's called Four Helpful List. This is all over the internet. You could just Google Four Helpful uh, List. But it's such an important tool. Just imagine four columns on a white sheet of paper. On the far left is the first column, the first list. What's working well? What's, what's going right? What's the good news in your life that can be amplified or optimized? Make a list, some bullets, five, six, or seven things that are really going well in your journey. Column two, what's wrong? What's broken? What needs to be fixed? What needs to be corrected? Third column, what's confusing and needs clarification? What needs more study? What needs more research? What needs more uh, understanding? Clarifying what is confused can be a huge step in self-awareness and self-leadership. And then the fourth column, first column, what's right, second column, what's wrong, third, what's confused, and fourth, what's missing and needs to be added. What are the, what are the, what are the voids in my life that I've just completely overlooked? Though sometimes those are so hard to see that I need to add. This is a tremendously helpful exercise. You can use it on yourself. You could use it in counseling or coaching others. You could use it to improve your marriage. You can use it, frankly, to improve your parenting. You can use it at work uh, as a team dynamic or even an entire uh, 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 company. It's a tremendous tool. And once you make these lists, again, this is a tool not for solutions but so much for perspective and determining where am I, where are we right now. It's a great tool establishing current reality. Once you get these four lists made, Then just look at those and decide which of these are the most important now. The most important now. What needs the most attention now, immediately? And then just pick those top three and get a plan, get a strategy, and go to work on improving all of those. So it can be a great, helpful tool to help you to lead yourself better. I also have something that I did years ago. I call it a better dozen. Uh, These are sentences that I think every person should be able to complete in order to have a greater self-awareness, which can lead to greater self-leadership. Just listen to these sentences, and how would you complete them? I am really good at. I am not good at. I am energized by. I am drained by. And that energized or drained, that could be a who, or it could be an activity. Some people and activities energize us. Some people and activities drain us. Five, my core values are. Six, my life purpose is. 
Seven, I am motivated by. Eight, I want my character to be. Nine, my desire and ability to connect with others is. Ten, my blind spots I need to improve are. My signature temptation to sin is. And then last, kind of a legacy statement, I want to be remembered as. Two more helpful things and how can I better lead myself. Know yourself to lead yourself. Four helpful lists, the better dozen. Next, four, seek. Don't wait, seek regular, honest feedback. You can't lead yourself by yourself. Feedback is a friend. Ask for it. And then number five, never stop growing and developing. Mark Twain had a friend who died. He died at 70. When he was asked about his friend, Mark Twain said, we buried him at 70, but he died at 40. Hey, friend, stay hungry, stay curious, keep learning. Keep learning. So, in wrapping things up in this important episode, are there benefits from stronger self-awareness that leads to greater self-leadership? You bet there are. Let me just mention a few. Greater self-confidence, deeper meaning and purpose, decreased stress, increased well-being and fulfillment, improved relationships, better decision-making, increased engagement, improved productivity, sustained influence, sustained performance, and even more. Wouldn't we all like those kind of benefits in our journey as a leader? Daniel Goldman, again, I go back to him, said exceptional leadership becomes so because of superior self-leadership. So, where do you need to do a better job leading yourself? Lead yourself well, my friend, so you can lead others better. Never stop asking yourself, what is life like for those I'm leading? What's life like on the other side of me? Listen, my friend, you are in charge of you. Your emotions, your thoughts, your reactions, your responses, your motivations, your decisions. And there's one common denominator in all of those, and that's you. You have participated in every decision that you have ever made. Your greatest responsibility and your toughest challenge is to lead yourself well. Embrace it. You won't be a leader worth following if you don't lead yourself well. Great leaders last because they lead themselves well first. Thanks for listening to Teaching That Transforms with Dr. Jimmy Knott. Remember, teaching only transforms when consistently practiced. I look forward to you joining me next time.